Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Good morning. It's good to see your shining faces this morning, and uh, as well as I uh, know we've got people joining us online. I want to thank them for joining us online and uh, being a part of it. Uh, have you ever had an ID, like your driver's license, that didn't look anything like you before? Now, some, I know that some of you have said that's not me, but it really did look like you, but um, man, uh, several years ago when I moved here from uh, Illinois, uh, the driver's license there were, I don't know, I think they were longer before you had to renew them or something, or maybe I just didn't renew mine, I'm not certain. But I moved here, and uh, um, uh, in those days, this is in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, we wore our hair longer, okay? And uh, hairstyles were different. Don't be making fun of those of us who were, you know, during that time period and stuff, but hairstyles were different. And uh, I had a beard at that time. I was in graduate school, and, and uh, I think when I had my picture taken, it was a cold Illinois day, and I had not trimmed my beard, and I had a stocking cap on, and I they told me I couldn't have the cap on when they took the picture, so I took it off, and it was kind of one of those wild hair days, you know, and my beard was kind of, yeah, I didn't think anything about it, never thought much about it, and I moved here, and in the process of a couple of years, also I wore glasses, and I switched to contacts uh, about that time, and uh, um, I'm moving to a new place. I shaved my beard. I got a... a less long haircut for those days, and it still parted in the middle. It was a glorious time. Uh, and uh, I, I came here, and I didn't get my license changed for a little while, <laughs> a couple of years or so. And th during those days, you wrote checks a lot. Remember when you used to go to a grocery store, and you buy a gallon of milk, and you'd write a check for $1.98, you know? <laughs> and so, Homeland was across the street from uh, um, our old church that we were at in that time, and my wife was always calling me saying, would you bring home X, Y, Z for, before supper? And I would go over and I'd write a check. And I would go up, when you wrote checks, people would always ask for a form of ID. So you bring out your driver's license and you'd hand it to them. And this is a response from various uh, checkout clerks. What is your birth date, mate? Um, and I give the birth date, and they go, okay. And <laughs> decide, you know, a little, little hurt feelings would get into your soul, you know, because my ID was that I had, it was a real ID, but it didn't look anything like me. I had changed. My, cha my residence was different, you know, still had the Illinois address, 104 Sherry Lane, and uh, wasn't uh, 517 uh, Foltz Lane anymore, you know, at that time. And everything had changed. My looks had changed. My place of residence has changed, and, and it did not look like me and stuff. And so that's a little bit of what we're dealing with here in the book of Ephesians. You're going, how did you get from there to there? <laughs> Follow me on this, all right? So in our study of the book of Ephesians right now that we're going through, we're talking about having a real ID. And I, I suppose if you had a subtitle on this, it is becoming who our ID says we are, our position in Christ. And last week, Steve did a great job of describing the privileges and purposes we have because we are in Christ. As a matter of fact, as you read through Ephesians 1, hope you did that this past week, uh, you may have noticed that there was a word that was used over and over again, 22 times in the original text. It says, in, and it's either in Christ or in Him or in Jesus or some 22 different times to refer to the position that we have in Christ. The book of Ephesians, the little letter was written to Christians, you need to keep that in mind, to Christians who were living in a city called Ephesus, and their ID had changed. They were something before 
they came into Christ. And there was a, a different look to them from where they were before Christ and who they were in Christ. Now, they hadn't completely done that whole what we call biblically sanctification process that we're all in the midst of right now in Christ. Their position was there, but they, uh, they didn't look like they did before because they were being transformed by Christ. And so Paul in chapter 2 that we're going to look at this morning, he talks about who we used to be. And he says, you're not who you were. But he goes into graphic detail talking about who we were. And I think it is a really important. Paul thought it was important for us to get that grasp, that understanding that we are not who we were. We are something, we are different. Uh, we have changed in some way. I, I have a new ID now that I got because I've got a real ID. How many of you have gotten your real ID yet? All right, some of you are right there. Uh, two years ago when that first came out, they said you couldn't fly without this thing, and so I went to go get one. They took my picture. There's a white background behind me. And we were going to Utah to uh, do some hiking. I'd let my beard grow out. And if you look at this, you can't find me. I'm not there, just two beady eyes looking out. So once again, I underwent this troubling feeling that the person at the safety entrance, you know, where they look, check your ID, she looks at it, she looks at me, she looks at it, she looks at me. Were you sick this day? I said, no. When did you attend the Andrew Carnegie course for how to win friends and influence enemies. <laughs> she didn't think that was funny, and I got strip searched. No, you didn't really. <laughs> but, uh, but sometimes we don't look like our idea because we're in the process of becoming, but we're not who we were. And that's what Ephesians chapter 2 is all about, um, that we are becoming something different from where we used to be. Now, everyone agrees, I think, that there is a problem in this world. Don't you agree with that? There's something that's there. I don't think anybody disputes the fact that there's something wrong. Not, not just in the world, but there's something wrong in me. Now, don't amen that part. I'm talking about all of us, all right? So there's something wrong that's within me, too. There's a, uh, and it personally, it's kind of expressed in words like this, you know, I've got to get in shape. I've got to get into the gym, you know. I've got to start eating differently. I've got to get a handle on my finances, right? Uh, I, I want to be more generous. I want to be bolder, more courageous in my decision making. Uh, I want to be more of this and less of that, uh, body-wise or whatever it is. We all get this sense that I'm not what I should be. I want to be more or I want to be less. That's why if you go on Amazon, you'll see hundreds of thousands of books on self-help books about how we need help becoming who we want to be. They're all over the place. And, and I think we will admit that there's something wrong with this world, and sometimes we'll admit there's something wrong within me. I mean, why? Why do human beings who are so amazing do horrible things with and to each other? I mean, what's wrong with us? And it's important to figure out what, what it is that's going on in there because the magnitude of any solution is directly proportionate to the magnitude of the problem, right? It's true with any problem. I mean, medically speaking, you know, if I get a paper cut or something of that nature, you know, you look at it, and if you're on blood thinner, it may be a little more <laughs> concerning than if you're not. But if you get a cut, you know, normally, I mean, my way of doing some of this, you know, <laughs> suck the blood out and go on, but not, that's probably not a wise idea. You get some infection that way. But you, you may want to put a Band-Aid on it, put some pressure on it or something like that, and then you go on. No big deal, right? You get the flu may feel rotten for a couple of days, not feeling really good. Um, you may go to bed. You may drink some, lots of wick, uh, liquids. You may want to take some aspirin. may take some drugs or something like that, but you, you get over it. But then we get diagnosed with cancer. It becomes a little more complicated then. You go see a specialist. 
You may have to have some surgery. You may have to have chemotherapy. Uh, you may have to see a string of specialists before you're able to find out some hope of what's going on. The solution may be more complicated than if you get a paper cut on your finger. You know, it's still. It's, you know, but if physically you are dead, it requires more than a Band-Aid, doesn't it? It requires a miracle. I mean, the, the reality is the magnitude of the solution is directly proportionate to the magnitude of the problem. How bad off are we? You're discouraged, facing some discouragement in, in your mind. You may need somebody to come alongside you and encourage you. You may need somebody, uh, you may need to get a life coach. You know, maybe, maybe it's a physical thing. You need to get a personal trainer or something like that. You need somebody to come in from the outside, perhaps, and work with you to be able to get over that hump within your life. But if you're dead, if you're dead, you need a miracle. Now, you, you need some, probably some diagnostic work in your own life as you examine your life and see whether you're dead or alive. And probably we'll need some outside help because <laughs> we're all notoriously bad about self-diagnosing ourselves, correct? A few years ago, I guess a couple of years ago, in February of 2021, i just come through COVID. I uh, was struggling stuff with getting any energy in my life, you know, it was uh, uh, slow, and I decided I just got to I've got to get some exercise to build my strength back up. So I started walking, doing some working out and stuff. It was in February. It was kind of colder. I began having trouble, some trouble breathing. And I thought, ah, I must have caught a little bit of a cold or something like that. And that's, this went on for a few weeks. And I kept getting at times this tingling in my leg, but especially in my chest, just this tightness that was in the chest and having a hard time breathing. So one Friday morning, I went to go get a haircut so I didn't look like my old ID picture anymore. I went to go get a haircut, and man, all of a sudden, I just, I could not breathe at all. And I pulled off the side of the road, and I'm trying to catch my breath, and I can't catch my breath. And by this time, I'm beginning to panic a little bit. So I decide, this is not a wise thing to do, but I decide to drive back home <laughs> down York Street. So I come down York Street, pull into my neighborhood, pull into my driveway, and my wife happened to be out in the driveway, and so I'm honking my horn. She's giving me that look that she used to give the kids, and gives to me, too, quite often. And uh, so she comes over the car, you know, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's going on? What's the importance? And I said, I, I can't breathe. So we I got over to the other side of the car, and I said, well, let's go to the urgent care. She made me get on the other side of the car, and so she's going to drive, and I said, I, let's go to the ER instead. So I get the ER, and I find out I've got like 13 blood clots in my legs and more than that in my right lung. Self-diagnosis was not very good on that. I was worse off than I thought I was, you know? And we all do that. We're not very good at self-diagnosis. And when it comes to our spiritual life, we're even worse in that area. We need somebody coming in from the outside. We need to find out what God thinks about the whole situation, you know? So the reality is we need help with our diagnosis of what's wrong. We need to hear what God says about our condition because if we're going to take the necessary cure, we have to know how bad the disease is to begin with. And the Bible's assessment of us is much worse than we think it is. Turn, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, if you will. And we're just going to walk through the first 10 verses, kind of make some comments and unpack this as we go along the way. So he begins Ephesians chapter 2, and this is the first thing you need to know, and that is, spiritually speaking, you're dead. You were dead. If you're not in Christ, you're dead. And he says, would you read with me the, ver the first part of verse 1 of Ephesians 2? You were dead dead in your trespasses and your sins. That's who we were. Now, if you're in Christ, we're not who we were. We is who we are. <laughs> Make sense? But he says you're, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We don't use that word trespasses very often anymore. Maybe if you recite the Lord's Prayer, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We don't even know what it really means. A trespass is mean that you're somewhere you're not meant to be or you're not supposed to be, all right? 
trespasses and your word we don't like to talk about, is it? Sins. I heard a preacher last night that said the middle of the word sin is I. <laughs> and that is true. It's all about me, and that's how I get in the condition that I am in. So, sin. That means uh, we're doing something, thinking something that we were never meant to do or think about. We're dead. As a result of that th- w- way of thinking, we're dead because of the trespasses in our, our life. We are spiritually dead. We don't like that. We don't really even want to know that, but that is who we are. And he says that not only that, he says, it's interesting, when Paul was trying to grab a hold of, is that a good word, grabbed hold of? I was listening to a black preacher yesterday. He had used that word about 10 times. Now it's in the back of my mind all the time. We need to grab a hold of, I guess, why he uses this word dead. I think that Paul is saying that we are so far distant from what God meant us to be, that we we're so far different distance from what a man is supposed to be, what a woman is supposed to be. And while Paul was searching for the language to describe this convention in our life, he gets grabbed to hold the word dead, death. He uses it like a corpse, lifeless, hopeless, non-responsive, death. And he said, this is the way you previously walked. That's the environment that you walked around in. You were walking dead. Kind of a strange image to portray. But we are so distant from God that we were or are not spiritually alive. And there are little things that mark us as a result of that. Every once in a while, we hear about horrible things that happen in the world. A school shooting. Someone who's just an innocent bystander standing on a street corner gets caught in the crossfire of gang violence. You have someone who gets so mad on a highway, road rage takes over, they crash into someone else, run them off a cliff, sometimes off the mountain or whatever, and the driver dies in a fiery death. And when they come upon those scenes, the news reporters, I'm talking about the secular news reporters, will come to that and they'll say, gosh, they're just this... Where does this evil come from? This is secular news boy. You hear that all the time. They actually ponder evil. Was it, was it environment? Maybe, the, you know, maybe it's an external thing. It's the environment. The, the person grew up in a toxic neighborhood or a toxic family, you know, or he or she spent too much time feeding on violence. Maybe it's chemical. You know, they're under the influence of some kind of chemical, whether it be alcohol or, or meth or cocaine or whatever it might be. Or the reporter sometimes will interview someone else in the crowd, and they'll say, well, it's because they rejected God. People look for all kinds of causation in these different places, social, nurture, nature, physical, spiritual, internal, external. And most assume that the Bible just grabs hold of that one strand, the spiritual strand, and think that that's an accurate view of the Bible. It's not. Actually, the Bible says, what causes these things? The Bible says, is it nurture and nature? He says, yes. The Bible says, yes. There is a, there's a darkness in humanity that's a part of that component. There's a darkness in the social component. There are physical components, external and internal components. And Paul goes on, he says this, this is the way you previously walked in the ways of the world. According to the prince of the power of air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. There is this movement in the world, and and we kind of get in the stream of that walking or swimming along that just kind of pushes us towards the dark side. It pushes us towards evil within our life. And we get caught up in it. We, we spend time with people who think nothing about what God thinks about things, but they are all involved in what they own think, their own thinking. And we live in the stream of our friends, and we never stop to think, what does God think about that? And we've all heard stories of social and peer pressure and social conformity. 
And this, this is all across the board. Oftentimes we, listen to me very carefully, oftentimes we evaluate the things of our world and things of our, in our life by the thinking of the stream we're swimming in, by the thinking of the generation that we walk in. And it's not just one generation, it's every generation. I mean, I'm a baby boomer. It means I boomed out of here in the babies. I don't know what it means. It's a section. It's becoming the older people in the world now. And sometimes we judge things as baby boomers the way we think it ought to be without ever consulting what God thinks it ought to be. And it's true of every generation. This is across the board no matter what generation is. Reality is, listen, we just ride along in the stream just like the rest of the world, away from honoring our Creator and towards whatever we want to do. And the result is we become our own God. A few years back, I read a couple of books. Actually, I've read more than that, but a few years back, I read a couple of particular. One was written by a former rock, heavy metal rock guitarist. The other was by a journalist. And uh, it's interesting because both at the beginning of their books um, had, were absolutely against anything that had to do with belief in God. And yet, both in the process of writing and going through this journey in life, they both went on a spiritual journey. And by the end of the books, both believed solidly that there was a God. Now, what opened both of these writers up to the spiritual world was a conviction that there is something spiritually dark out there in the world. Paul calls it a prince, a power in the world that can control us. I think many of us have experienced that. We've sensed that. There's a lot of anger in our heart, and you can track it back to a social thing, workplace. You can track it back to your family that you grew up in, which there are still things festering in you and a refusal to forgive. And so as this unforgiveness begins to well up with inside of us, there's a power that's inside. There's a spirit that just encourages us to be angry, to feed the flames, and you toss in some more unforgiveness, and it just explodes. There's something that's feeding that which within is that is dark. The Bible calls it a ruler, a prince, the power over the air. And it's interesting, you meet with people all the time and say, or at least I meet with people all the time and say, I'm just not interested in the things of God. I'm just not interested in spiritual things at all. I, I, I just, I want to be free to do whatever I want to do. But the Bible says that person doesn't exist. We're either in the kingdom of God or we're in the kingdom of the world. One of the two, there's nothing in between. You're in one kingdom or the other. And this kingdom, I want you to know, is very dark. It's very dark. So, last part of verse 2 says this, it's the spirit that's now working, and some versions say the sons of disobedient, but it's in the disobedient. And then in verse 3, Paul draws himself into the equation. He says, we too all previously lived in our fleshly desires, carrying out the desires of the flesh and thoughts. Yeah, there are external components. We grew up in a bad environment. Our friends encouraged us to do messed up th- stuff in junior high and senior high and college and young adults and on and on and on. And we went right along with it. Maybe we did it because the kid was cooler, and we thought if we did participate in the same things, we'd be cool too. But it didn't work out that way. It just led us further and further into self-hatred at times or self-absorption. Either way, it leads to darkness internally. There's temptations that you and I have. Just, can I take a short poll? Anybody ever had a temptation in their life? Okay. Anybody had a temptation in your life that you said, I like that. I like it a lot. And so we chase after it. That's an internal temptation. And there's something within us that spurs us towards that also. There's something that just kind of moves us towards that. We hear that temptation and and something inside of us just say, I want to do that. And you went for it. It wasn't just the lust of the body. Well, I got crazy in the moment, and I went after it, and that's what I did. But there's also something that we thought, I know what I'm about to do. 
is not the most loving thing to do, not the most beneficial thing to do, not the most beautiful thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. There's no victims here. All of us have stepped into the darkness, and all of us are dead by our very nature. We are, as the as next part of verse 3 says, we are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Do you get that? Because of the darkness in our life, external or internal, we are objects of wrath. That means that the wrath of God, God who hates sin, He hates sin. Did you, did you catch that? He hates sin. And the reason he hates sin is because he knows how it destroys his creation, individual creatures. And so when God looks at mankind, and at some point he's going to eradicate all that sin, all lawlessness. And we by nature are inextricably linked to that darkness. So that by that definition, we're all in trouble. We're all in trouble. I'm in trouble. You're in trouble. All God's children and not children are in trouble because there's a darkness within us. And so, if He wipes away all the pettiness, all the abuse, no one will get away with anything. Now, the troubling thing with all this is and I, I do this too, we all do, we think that evil is out there, right? Man, those people are evil. They're evil. And we think evil's out there. But evil is also in here. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you may not even know who that is. He's a Russian dissident. He's now dead <laughs> physically. And uh, he uh, stood up against the communist Russia in, in ways like nobody else said this in one of his books. He says, if only there were a group of evil commi people committing evil deeds, deeds somewhere over there, then all we'd have to do is gather them up and eradicate them. But there's, there's this, this deal within the side of us that if, if we don't watch out, we, we, we kind of get this thinking, I'm not the one that's a bad person, Right? I'm not dead. And, and I, I thought about that. I think sometimes we don't realize when we're on the other side of the cross how dead we actually are. There's three instances in the New Testament where, where Jesus raises somebody from the dead. In, uh, in, Acts, in Mark chapter 5, it's also in Luke, Jairus' daughter. Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, my, my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter is sick. She's dying. Would you come? Would you help me? And Jesus says, yes, I will. So he comes and begins making his way towards the, the house where this guy lives. The mom in the house is holding the, her daughter, wanting desperately for her to be healed, and she dies. And the people come out of the house, and they say, don't trouble uh, the rabbi anymore. Your daughter's dead. And Jesus just walks in the house. Now, she had just been dead minutes. And there was not much of what you see happen in the body of a dead person going on yet. When a person first dies, uh, there may still be some warmth left in the body. The complexion may get a little bit paler. The mother is holding that child very closely to her. You might not have even realized that she was dead, but she was. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is walking towards um, a city called Nain, and just before he gets to the outskirts of the uh, gates, here comes a funeral procession outside the city of Nain. Now, you need to understand, there was, in Jewish society, there was no embalming or anything else. When a person died, they, you buried them just as quickly as you could, generally the next day. And here comes this funeral procession with this beer or B-I-E-R there, <laughs> and uh, I, like a, a casket that they're carrying outside the, the uh, city walls, and Jesus stops the procession. 
the widow is just crying her eyes out because dead is her son. That's her social security. In those days, you didn't have anything else unless you had children who would provide for you. And she's crying her eyes out, and Jesus stops the procession. Now, this guy had been hours dead, maybe 24, maybe 30 hours dead, and he has begun to show in his body some signs of, of uh, decomposition. Perhaps stiffness is set in, more than likely. Uh, waxy pallor in his cheeks and his body, cold to the touch, just a different stage, but he's dead. The third situation is Lazarus, Jesus' close friends in John 11. Jesus gets word that Lazarus is not doing well, and the two sisters, Mar Mary and Martha, ask Jesus to come, but he waits some time, and he dies. And so three to four days later, he arrives back where where uh, in Bethany, where Lazarus lives. And both the sisters are upset that Jesus was not there. And he said, let's go out to the burial space. And they're all standing there. And Jesus says, roll away the stone. And one of the sisters is really upset about that. And I, I love reading this in the old King James Version because she says, it's been three days and he stinketh. I like that word. He stinketh the decomposition and the corruption had already begun to show in his body. Three different ways which are people, they were all dead, but there was, they're in different stages of decomposition within their life. They look different. Lazarus had the stench of death. The little girl did not at all. Three different conditions, three different stages of decomposition, but all were dead. They're not different grades of death. They were all dead. The difference was how much corruption had begun to come to the surface. Now, some of you are thinking right now, and even say, I'm not dead in my trespasses and sins. I'm not that bad. I mean, look at James McCracken. Look at that old so-and-so. He's more corrupt than I am. He's more evil than I am. I mean, there are murderers and rapists and all kinds of crazy people out there doing all kinds of weird stuff. You're right. They have more the outward signs of corruption showing up in their life, more than is showing up in your life. But you're still dead. You may smell nicer. You may not stinketh, but you're still dead. And all of us by nature are dead, sobering news, bad news, horrible news. We're dead. Are you ready for some good news? Two words that in, in, in verse 4, two great words come from the text this morning. Two great words. First two words of Ephesians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 4 says, would you read me the first two words? But what? God. That's right. But God. But God. There's a contrast there. There's death, and then God steps into the situation. There is, there is no life. There's corruption showing, but God steps into the situation. Years ago, a friend of mine and I did uh, college retreats quite often up in Illinois, and we would have college students at a, at a kind of a big college rally and stuff, and uh, we were doing actually this, this passage, and I was assigned to do that passage, and I was... I was waxing eloquent. I was good that day. And so I'm doing the contrast on it, and I come to this verse, and I said, and next comes the great but of God. You're a little slower on the reaction than those college students were, let me tell you. They broke out laughing, and I didn't have a clue what they were laughing about. But it is. It's the great contest. And it's the great, not hiney of God, but the great bud of God. The contrast between there's death, there's stench, there's decomposition, there's no light, and God steps into the situation. And it says, but God being rich in what? Mercy. Because of his great love that he has for us, he steps into the situation. That's, this is really a great summary of what the gospel is. We were dead, but God, but the words but God is the greatest news we can hear. We're dead, but God changes that. We are dead. We have no hope. But God, being rich in mercy and a great love for you, he steps in. 
So what does the God who is rich in mercy do for you and I? Next part of the verse. But God, being rich in mercy, makes us alive in Christ. When God enters the room where this little lifeless girl is being hugged by her mother, everyone knew she was dead. But God stepped into the room and he touched her and he said, Talitha kum, little daughter, I say, rise up. Now, some of you may have been a good little girl most of your life, but spiritually you are miles apart from God. You're not alive. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even though we're dead in our trespasses and skin. Jesus steps into the midst of the funeral procession and he touches the casket. Death was very much present, but God made him alive. Lazarus was rotting and stinking and Jesus cried out, roll away the the stone, Lazarus come forth, dead. But God, being rich in mercy, made him alive in Christ. I hear some noise within you this morning that says, but I'm not that bad off. I'm not that bad of a person. I'm not dead, but corruption is in us. The channel of evil runs through us at all, and you may not realize you are decomposing, but God in his mercy and Jesus is, came to bring little girls and young men to life. Others of you may be saying, saying, you're thinking, I'm too far gone. You don't know the amount of corruption that's in me. I've tried to hide it. Actually, friend, it's worse than you think. But God, rich in mercy, has Jesus coming into Lazarus that day and coming into the Lazarus they're here in this room today. And in his mercy, he says, though you were dead, you are still alive. You will live. And that's his message. God does not make bad people better. He gives life to dead people. And so verse 8, famous verses in the Bible, verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians 2. For you are saved by grace through faith. That is not of yourselves. It's a gift not from works that anyone can boast. Please know it's not about how many church services you've attended. It's not about how many Bible verses you know or the rules that you've kept, or the promise that you made this morning you're going to cuss a little less. None of that. The problem is intense, but, intense, but the solution is amazing. Grace through faith. I have nothing to bring to the table. I'm going to trust that God will forgive me. I have, I have nothing to bargain with, but I trust that God will do a miracle in my life. I have nothing in my life that's going to do a in my life. I can only trust God. It is God's not surrender. It is God's gift that no one may boast. No one may boast. That is why, that is why an arrogant Christian is an arrogant Christian. of him. It's a gift. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. It's because he is rich in mercy. So when the end comes, there is no boasting. Hey, guys, no one's going to arrive in heaven, heaven and God's going to go, whoa, looky there. There is James McCracken. When, what? I mean, he is the stud muffin of, of Muskogee. Just, just welcome him in. Yay, way to go, James. You are so good. You didn't do anything wrong. You're so good. Come to this chair. You deserve every bit of that. That ain't going to happen. And not just because it's me. It's because I was dead. And God made me alive because of his rich mercy in my life. Nothing I did deserves it. Everything he did is a gift to bring me into that chair. No one in heaven's going to applaud other than the fact that they're going to applaud God's grace and his mercy that that happened, that he is great in richness and mercy. And it's going to be the greatest moments of our life. Now, the question is, are you alive or are you dead? When you're dead, there's no hope. You're stinking dead, clothed in your own self-righteousness. But because of 
His great love He has for us. He made us alive in Christ Jesus, though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. And together, because we are saved by grace, God puts us in Christ, and that means we have reservation in the throne room because of what He has done for us. It's through the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Are you dead or alive? Once again, I'm not asking you if you've been to church. I'm not asking you if you've made a pledge to work with the Gospel Rescue Mission for the, every day of your life for the next year. I'm asking, are you dead or alive? By nature, you're dead. But in Christ, you've been made alive. Have you said, Jesus, if you're saving people, <laughs> I'm here, come and get me. I had the weird, I had a strange thing happen this week. Um, I can't remember if it was Wednesday or Thursday. Got a phone call at the church. A guy was walking down in front of Shawnee and uh, gone through some tough times in his life. I mean, heard his story. Uh, you, you just heard him of some things that happened in his life. And some of them, as he said, were because of my own stupidity. And he was just at the end. And he calls the church, and for some reason, Suzanne, our receptionist, answered it, and she put him on hold to try to find me. I, th I think I was the only guy in the building at that, that particular day or that particular moment, or I thought it was. And she went away, and all of a sudden, my phone rings in my office, and I pick it up. And this guy, I didn't know who he was, and he just says, I need to, t I need to talk to someone. Well, I, I made a bad judgment. I thought... He's just here. He wants some money. And so I thought, I need to go out and, and get him and talk with him if I could. But there's something about his desperation that disturbs me, disturbed me. So I stopped by, and Brady was in the hallway. And I thought, Brady's tall. He's big. I'm short. I'm going to take Brady with me. Ba Brady, you're my buddy right now. So Brady and I go out, and we meet this guy. And we start talking outside, and we end up coming inside. And... Uh, he is at wit's end. He walks down Shawnee and he said, I, I need to talk to somebody. And he said these words, I need to be saved. And he had come to do the regional choir. And he graduated from Dakota and he did a regional choir contest here at Boulevard. And he said, I've been in that building. I'm going to go see if somebody will talk to me. So he comes in. We talk, and he says, I just feel like I'm in a tunnel, and it's so dark, and I can't see the end anywhere I go. So we had the opportunity. Actually, we just went through Ephesians chapter 2, and he said, that's the light I need. So he accepted Christ right there in the spot. Yeah, yeah that's good. So, and it's not... Not because Brady and I have such great conversational ability. It's because God had him right where he needed to be. So I talked to him about how baptism is putting away the old life and God giving you a new life, just what you've experienced here. It's a great, great way to express it. I said, when would you like to be baptized? And he went, I've got time. <laughs> so we baptized him. Yeah. So, it, here's what's cool. We were walking down the steps, coming down here, and walking down, and he said, you know what? I think I found the light at the end of the tunnel. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his masterpiece. We are his workmanship. And he created us in Christ Jesus for good works. This is... After you're saved, he's got, a, he's got some things for you, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk with them. If you're in Christ, let me encourage you. He's not finished with you yet. You've come from death to life, and he's got a whole lifetime and eternity prepared for you to, to make a difference in other people's lives. And he's working on you every moment of the day. When you first come back to life, it's a process of becoming who He has declared you to be. 
I read this week about Michelangelo's statue of David. Have you ever seen that? Or maybe it's seen pictures, more than likely it's in Florence, Italy. Michelangelo, when he was going to create this, commissioned to create this incredible sculpture, began looking for marble, a piece of stone that would be able to, he would create this masterpiece from. He looked a lot of different places. He went to a quarry uh, in Italy, and there was a big hunk of stone. He envisioned this th statue to be about 19 to 20 feet tall, and he said, I think this will do, but it had a lot of flaws in it. It had some cracks in it. They didn't know whether, how it would stand up. Matter of fact, several sculptures had rejected that statue or that's that piece of marble to make a statue's room. Michelangelo did it, and he began creating this work of art that is just phenomenal that stands in Florence, Italy. They've created this room with this dome on it. People come. There's lots of other things in the museum. They don't want to see anything else. They just come to see David. They come and walk through, walk back out, and they're just in awe because of the, how the detail that Michelangelo is able to put into that statue. If hunks of marbles could talk and think. I know some of you think you're hunks, but I'm talking about hunks of marble right now. If it could think, it would be of the height of stupidity for a statue to say, look how fantastic I am. My name is David. I am perfect. Gaze upon me in wonder. You'd probably answer, take it easy, dude. You didn't build you. You didn't help out. You didn't write out some sort of instruction manual, handle it to Michelangelo and say, this is the way you cut me out. This is the way you know, I'll look the best. You were a passive participant in the whole process. You did nothing. It was when the master grabbed that flawed chunk of marble and begin chiseling into you, he made you into something beautiful. And it'd be equally stupid for the statue to shake his head and go, I'm just a discarded stone. So many honors have rejected me. It, it strikes so deep within me. I can hardly go on. You would probably respond, dude, you're David. I just paid 25 bucks to see you and stand 50 feet away. I'm going to buy a book that's going to be four times that much to see pictures up close. Why am I going to spend that money? Because you're David. Yeah, you were a discarded stone. But the master got his hands on you, and he began to work on you, and you have a different identity. You're not a flawed chunk of stone. You're David. Don't forget it. As Christians, we get to simultaneously be humble and confident. Humble because I'm flawed. Humble because I don't have everything figured out. Humble because God's doing a work in me and I, I'm not that spiritual. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But at the same time, you don't wallow in shame because you are something precious. You're an emblem of grace of God. You stepped out of the flow into battle. You, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do something good that he's prepared for you. Question, have you responded to the grace of God? Have you said to God, I, I receive the mercy that you provide. I want to be alive. Today, today would be a great time to respond. I'm going to pause for a moment. We're going to pause for a moment and give you that opportunity right now. Maybe you're like my friend that I met on Thursday, that you're waiting to say, God, I want to be saved. Would you bow your head? Take a moment to speak to God right now. And if you're dead, your trespasses and sin, ask Him to forgive you. Confess that you know the reality of your situation. 
Father, we thank you for hearts that are crying out across this auditorium and, and throughout places where they're watching online. Father, we ask that you would come in the midst of the cry that you hear and you might lead them out of the darkness into the light. In Jesus' name, amen. If you responded this morning to, that, to God's gift that he has for you, I'm going to ask that while we sing this next song, uh, there will be decision coaches on the left and right of the stage to discuss the decision that you have made and talk with you about the next steps you can take in your life. Won't you come as we stand and we sing?